Hello again, we are Mark and Mark, he is Shine, I am Miller, and this is a closer look, and we're glad you joined us again. It is so cold out there, Mark. <laughs> yeah. I like clean, cold weather. I'm not big on wind, I'm not big on ice and snow. I like clean, cold weather. It's time to move on. Well, it has caused havoc with our it basketball has. schedule. We're going to try to catch you up, so let's review some games. Mark, starting off with Liberty Benton at Kenton. Well, my two games are shootouts. Unfortunately, not enough of those go on anymore, but I have Kenton and Liberty Benton. This ended up uh, played at Kenton last Saturday night. Liberty Benton will win this game or lose this game 71-78, but they're ahead at halftime 35-33. The second half is all Kenton, 45, 36. That's a lot of points on the board. Yeah. And the usual suspects doing the scoring again for Kenton. Jaden Cornell has 26. Jacob Eversole with 17. Jerem Sharp with 16. Will Poling and Austin May, 28 and 19 for Liberty Benton. The same names we hear all the yeah. time. Liberty Benton came back on Monday night with a league win over Van Lu. Once again, May with 28. Poling with 18. They're 2 and 8 now, 2 and 2 in the BVC. Kenton will go to St. Mary's this week. They are 7-3 and three and 1-1 one and one in the Western Buckeye League. All right, Saturday night, Mark and I went down to Anna High School, did St. Henry and Anna. St. Henry came away with a win, 62-59. This was their only game of the weekend after all those cancellations took place on Friday night. For St. Henry, Tyler Schlarman, 23 points, three threes. He can just play. He can play all over that floor. For Anna, Wyatt Benzman had 15, Griffin Dosek 12, and Joel Cathcart 12. So they had good even scoring. St. Henry battled a lot of personal fouls that put Anna on the free throw line, but they did hit some shots at the end that came away with this game that any either team really could have won. And this, this is two good teams. They're going to win a lot of games this year. And the thing we talked about during the course of the game, it looks like St. Henry's in control. Anna makes a run. St. Henry answers. Anna makes a run. Anna just kept coming and coming, kind of ran out of time. Yep. Yep. All right, let's move on. Ottawa Glandorf, 78 to Finley Trojans, 69. Coming into this game, OG was 11-0. Finley was 7-3, but had won six out of their last seven. Tight game all the way. Big first half for a couple of players. Jay Kaufman had 14 of OG's 18 points in the second quarter. Ryan Roth had six made threes in the first, quarter, first half for Finley, and we're tied going into the third quarter. Uh, we're still tied with 30, with 60 seconds, 60 minutes to go. Well, I got to start over again, Mark. We're tied at 60, late in the third quarter after Jacob Logston makes a three, but OG with Kaufman gets a basket, then Hegel gets a steal, a score, and another steal, and a score, and they go on to win to the uh, OG Titans by nine. Ryan Nunn uh, had a big night. He had uh, 17, Roth had 20, Logston had 17 for Finley. Kaufman with 25, Hegel with 19, White with 17. OG made 10 out of 19 three-point field goals. On Monday night, OG came back with a 79-60 win over Van Wert. With four players in double figures. They're now 12-0 and 3-0 in the Western Buckeye League. Finley has a big game coming up this weekend. They're 7-4, 2-2, and they get number one on the track, Toledo St. John's, on Friday night at home. Well, last Tuesday night, Garrett and I went to Versailles to do two highly ranked teams, two undefeated teams, Fort Loramie and Versailles, and it went to two points and it went to overtime. Less than two seconds away from double overtime, Fort Loramie 48, Versailles 46. Versailles was down 10 points in the second half. They staged a big comeback. And for Fort Loramie, Tyler Siegel had some beautiful blocks that you're going to show yep. and talk about later. Evan Burning hit a three to tie the game with just under two seconds to go. And then due to a technical foul for calling timeouts when no timeouts were left, Dylan Braun stepped to the free throw line and made two free throws for that two point win. Of course, for Versailles, everybody says, how many points did Arns have? Well, are you talking about Justin or AJ? Cause Justin only had 12, but AJ had 21 and he did it all. He was the best player on the floor that night and very, very impressive. But these two teams, get ready tournament, because these two teams are going to have a run. Yeah, there's two really good basketball teams right there, both highly rated in the state. Let's go to a PCL matchup with Ottoville and uh, Pandora Gilboa. Okay, you're Joe Bradick. We're struggling in the first half, and Drew Johnson, your leading scorer, leading rebounder, has got two fouls. Well, Drew sat out most of the first half. Ottoville was up three at halftime, and then Jared Brees comes through with a big second half uh, for PG. PG outscored Oville. 19 to 6 in the third quarter in the second half after going 0 for 6 in the first half. Brees had 12 points and two assists in the second half. Cooper McCullough, another good scoring game for PG. He had 18 with three feet, threes. 
Johnson came back to finish with 13. Nick Mormon had 18, including making nine free throws for Ottoville. Josh Turbin had three, made threes and 11 total points. Ottoville now 11 and three. They have Miller City at home. That's a big game on Friday night. PG is 10 and one. They're 4 0 in the BVC. They lead to PCL. And this Friday night, they have North Baltimore at home in a BVC matchup. All right, let's look at some of our stat stuffers. Guys, it really put some numbers up, and I get to start. Marcus Bruns from Coldwater had 23 points, including three threes in their win against Salina. Well, how many times have we heard this year, hey, you know what, Crestview struggling. Well, it's pretty good to be struggling the way Crestview is right now because they really got it going, partly because Derek Stout had a big night uh, with 21 points, and they beat Arlington 73-36. Crestview's on a roll right now. Mark Kuhlman from Miller City, 30 points and two threes, including 10 made free throws in their win against Lincoln View. Well, Columbus Grove started out not very well this year, but they're up to five and seven right now, partly because Dane Selby the other night had a big game against Lipsick. This was a PCL game. Dane came in averaging a little over five points a game. Yeah, well, he had 23 in this game, and Grove beat Lipsick 63-53. Another team on a roll, Shawnee. They haven't lost since... Uh, well, heck, yeah. last year, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Anyway, Johnny Caprell has been one of their main scorers, and he was again this weekend against uh, Delphi St. John's. He had 29 points and three threes. I like about that. He had 29 points, and he needed all of them. They only won by oh. seven. Not one of those guys that gets a whole bunch of points when the game's out of reach. Well, how about Ridgemont? Okay, you're struggling. You're 0 for on the year. Jordan Street said enough of that. He had 37 points, including a made three-point field goal and seven rebounds. And Ridgemont finally got a win, 69-57 uh, over Riverdale. Congratulations to Shia Wheeler yep. from uh, Elida. Uh, in their game against Fort Jennings last week, she went over 1,000 points. We're starting to run them up yeah, again this year. But uh -huh. congratulations, Shia. What a great career. 1,000 points. In girls basketball, that's a bunch of points. A bunch of points. And we got another one might be happening because you've got Versailles coming up mm -hmm. a couple times this week. And Versailles, uh, A.J. Arns is now the third leading scorer in the MAC and could well be number one in MAC scoring by the time we get uh, through the weekend. We'll keep an eye on that. Yep. Let's go to our bright spots. And we've got some good ones for you. Yep. The first one, Mark, uh, we saw something at that halftime of that Fort Laramie yep. Versailles game that uh, – just amazed us. It is. And I, I saw them a year ago in the state tournament. Jerry uh, Snodgrass brought them in. This is a group you called, and they're called uh, the Pop, Pop Rock, Rocks. Pop Rocks. Let's take a look they at what they do. They are from Troy, Ohio. Uh, I looked to try to find out what ages they are. I don't know. They had some girls who were kind of small, young, like maybe 8, 9, 10, and then maybe up through uh, teenagers. I don't know if any of them were – I don't think any of them are out of high school. But these girls do a jump rope exhibition to some up-tempo songs. And uh, it was really choreographed. The only thing that I was sad about is I didn't have extra sets of eyes because there were so many things going on, I couldn't see it all. Well, then you found yeah, Ronnie down that? at Anna. Yeah, we're Look down at, at Anna the other night, and I know both of my grandsons love rockets. In fact, one of them had a rocket on his shirt when I left to go down to the game. So I said, okay, we're going to find the rocket mascot. And I didn't know his name. You know his name is Ronnie. You ask him Ronnie. Yeah, huh? and the mascot said, sure, I'll get my picture taken with you. So once again, mugging for the camera, and I immediately sent that out by text message to go. all three grandsons. The two of them responded very quickly. And uh, how about that? Thank you, Ronnie. We love, we love mascots. Yeah, we do. Hey, and the other thing that's coming up this Friday night is uh, Military Appreciation Night. Jerry Snodgrass started this initiative last year, yes, I it think. Yes, it is. Yep. And, and it's this uh, Friday. All over the state of Ohio, schools are urged to uh, give recognition to our veterans and, and pay homage to them. And I know several schools in this area, including the game that we're going to be at right. at Elida, uh, is inviting veterans to come in for free and giving them uh, free concessions. And, and students will do a lot of things wearing red, white, and blue. It's just going to be a great night on Friday. Yeah, we really hope that uh, people take that seriously. We, we appreciate what the military does here. Mark and I do it, everybody here at WOSN, and we hope that you do too. I know some places they want you to email in so we can get mm -hmm. your, your name and your service rank and where, what military branch you were in so they can honor you at the game. So all kinds of things going on. If you're going to a game this week on Friday night, and we hope you do, and you're a serviceman or a veteran, uh, contact the school you're going to and see what they're doing. Hey, well, we talked about a lot of games being canceled yeah. and having to be rescheduled, and Elida actually canceled one on Friday, made it up on Monday, canceled it on Monday. I don't know when they're going to make it up yeah. now. But anyway, the weather has really played havoc with the schedule in the last couple of weeks. You're a former coach. Yeah. That has to have an effect on a team. It, it really does. And we've talked many times on this show that when you're in a routine, you play better. And now people have gotten out of routines, and you're jamming games in when you don't want to play, and you're losing practice time. And 
part of it is, you know, we're all prepped to play on Friday night. Now we've got to switch gears and play somebody else on Saturday night and change our focus. And it's a nightmare for ADs. We interviewed uh, Brad Rex a while mm-hmm. back, and we talked to him about what a hassle is for him in an AD standpoint, rescheduling game workers and officials and so on. I just looked at Marion Local's schedule. Now, obviously, because of football playoffs, Marion Local got a really late start. They're going to play nine games in January. They're going to play eight games in February, and they will play 17 games in 51 days. Okay, now you're a player, you go, yes, we're playing mm-hmm. 17 games mm-hmm. in 51 days, and your coach going, how do I prepare for all these games we've got to get to? Players, I don't think they mind as much. I know at one point uh, they will play five, Mary Look and I will play five consecutive Fridays and Saturdays, and they have a stretch in January where they will play five games in nine days, and then they play February 9, 10, and 12. Trying to pack all those games in and get them in, it's a hassle for mm-hmm. coaches and everybody else. I guess players like it. I know sometimes I try to construct a schedule where you have a home game on Friday, away game on Saturday, or vice versa, and sometimes you can do that. Well, now that's all out the window. You're just playing them whenever you can. It's a struggle. That's right. Going to have some conflicts for the fans and yep. the athletic department, all kinds of things. So, you know, but it is what it is. We yep. have no choice, and uh, the athletic directors are out there busily trying to yep. schedule an open date to get these games all made up. All right, let's take a look at where are they now, our college players. Mark's got three from the same high school playing in college. Well, last week you talked about the Elida guys. Let's talk about the Lima Central Catholic guys this week. And, of course, they've got three very prominent players playing right now. Let's start with Martise Kimbrough. Martise was the Division III Player of the Year of a senior at Lima Central Catholic in 2014. He was the tournament MVP when uh, Lima Central Catholic won the tournament. He is the fourth leading scorer all time at LCC with 1,068 points. He then went to the University of Indianapolis. Well, and then he decided to transfer to Finley. And as a junior last year, he was an honorable mention All-American, first team All-GLIAC, averaging 19 points a game. His high was 41 against the University of Tiffin a year ago. This year, they are uh, Finley is 17-2. They're 11-0 in the GMAC, their new conference. And he averages almost 18 points a game, three rebounds, a couple of assists, and once again is shooting the basketball very, very well. And then Dantez Walton and Trey Cobbs from, the unit, from uh, LCC as well. They were both first team all state their senior year at Lima Central Catholic. They won a couple of state championships in 2014 and 16 and were runner up in 2015. Dantez Walton was co player of the year his senior year at LCC, averaging 19 points, nine rebounds, and four assists. Trey Cobbs averaged 19.7, was a thousand point scorer for the Thunderbirds and also as first team All-State his senior year. Well, they're now both at the University of Northern Kentucky, who's 12 and six, five and one in the Horizon League. They have lost by three to the league leader right now, Wright State. They will get them a little bit later on in the season as well. As a freshman, Dan Tez played in 29 games, averaging four points and two rebounds a game. This year, he's played in 18, all 18 games, averaging five points and three rebounds per game. He's had 22 steals, 22 assists, 10 steals and nine rebounds, playing about 16 minutes a game. Trey Cobbs has played in nine games as a freshman. This year he's played in 12. He's averaging 2.8 points per game. How about this? He's missed one field goal attempt this year. Coach, play me more. I've only missed one <laughs> shot. He also has nine he assists. Take more <laughs> yeah, right. Nine assists and two steals, averaging about seven minutes per game for Trey Cobbs. Three LCC guys having good college careers. They sure are. I turned the TV on the other day, kind of leafing through there, and I found Dantez playing for Northern Kentucky on TV. There you go. He he looked good out there. Yes, he did. All right, those are great players. We love watching them go on and play in college. And that's the end of our first segment. We'll be back in a minute. Mark's going to have some plays of the week for you. Hey, before we get to plays of the week, our resident expert official, Coach Shine, has a rule, and maybe it's the most important rule well, in the game because it deals with the basketball. Deals with the basketball. Okay. There you go. We thought we'd look at what a basketball is all about this week and on a closer look. And first of all, I got one boys ball, one girls ball, but actually boys and girls because middle school boys play with this mm-hmm. size ball as well. This one's a ladies ball. Now the rule book says they have to be orange, right? Well, not necessarily. They can also be red or brown. The OHSAA has frowned on the pink basketball that some people wanted to use for breast cancer awareness, and you can't use that funny thing we used to use in the ABA either. <laughs> they all have to be the same color. Uh, panels have to be the same color on this thing. This is a ladies' ball. It's 28 and a half inches in circumference. It can be up to 29 inches in circumference. This is a guy's ball. It's 29 inches in circumference. It can be up to 20, uh, 29 and a half. It can be up to, tw- to 30 inches in circumference as well. They're about the same weight. 
This one's a lady's ball. It's between 18 and 20 ounces. This is a guy's ball. It's between 20 and 22 ounces. The rule book says this ball is supposed to have about 8 to 9 uh, pounds per square inch of pressure inside of it. And that'll make it bounce just about right. So how high? Well, both balls are about the same. The rule book says if the bottom of the ball is 6 foot high and you drop it, the top of the ball should be between 49 and 54 inches off the floor. So what you find most officials do, just for an average type of thing, they hold it about shoulder height and they drop it and hope it comes up to waist height. We can't do it very well on this floor because this floor is dead because it's a stage and it doesn't work very well. But, and you'll see them do that before the game to make sure it bounces to about the proper height. If it's got too much air in it, the official carries a needle in his pocket, sticks it in there, lets a little bit of air out of it, tests it again. If there's not enough air in it, you hand it to game management and say, hey, fellas, go put a little bit more in this one. They'll test it out again. This is Rawlings basketball. So a few years ago, they had all kinds of them. They had Spaldings, and they had uh, Bodens, and they had uh, the Wilson Jet. And it uh, used to be, you know, you guys in football, right? You could, home team mm -hmm. gets, no, no. Offense gets to choose yeah. what ball to play with? Yeah, I guess, because the defense doesn't care. They, they usually <laughs> let the offense choose. But uh, so, by some leagues, you know, they have yeah. a, a, an official ball. Um, and then based on who gives them the most uh, stuff, you yeah. know, that's probably the ball that they're going to use. <laughs> the way it goes, yeah. Well, the OHSAA, because what I wanted to do, I had some teams that weren't very good. I wanted to play whenever the offense came on the floor, you got your ball. <laughs> which would slow the whole game down. Oh, it sure it would. take a long time yeah. to play. Anyway, yeah. Rawlings is the official ball now of the OHSAA for all regular season games and for tournament. And that's a little bit of look at basketball. This all right, week. good and job. We're going to get I, rid I, of these balls now because we're going to go. Yeah, camera guy, don't, he don't hit the camera. The camera don't guy won't catch. So I just all right, we got plays of the week, and we're going right. to start looking at defense. We talked about a little defense earlier. Mark's going to yeah, show you. Well, one thing I like is Tyler Siegel and how well he plays defensively. You can see the score here. Versailles is up to, we're in regulation. And what we're going to see is a play here. Um, Orange is going to go to the basket right here. Let's watch the play as we run through it. Here's the ball fake, goes to the basket, and watch the, the block without a foul. High by Tyler Siegel. Watch him time the block and gets the ball and not into the hands. Comes across him in help side situation. You can see how important that play was. Here's a miss. Here's a rebound. Here's the game winner. Nope, Siegel gets another block. That one was against A.J. Arns, and you see a charging foul right at the end of that. Here's a miss. And this basket would win the game, and Siegel says, nope, I got that one. And that's by the guy who might be the leading scorer in the MAC by the time this weekend's over. So a couple of great blocks and very important. And uh, here's the game winner right here. Comes off the screen, step back, jump shot, and that shot goes right there. Well, it's not exactly the game winner. That three puts him into overtime. And you can see how he comes off the screen right here. I think it's Evan Burning, Evan isn't it? Burning okay. right there. You called this game, Mark. Step back three. They needed every one of them, and that puts them into the situation where the game was tied. And you can see .9. They, and they the, ran it back up to 1.9. Yeah. And, of course, what happened was the unfortunate calling of an of a extra timeout that they didn't yeah. have. And here's another block. Watch this one right here. Tracing this one down and getting the block is teaming for St. Uh, St. Henry. This is in a game that we did this last week. Watch the timing. This looks like a transition basket for the sophomore Bixler. And instead, nope, I got this one. Kind of a LeBron James-like chase him mm -hmm. down. And then finally, watch this move inside uh, by uh, Broadman. Drop step power move, and that's just the way you teach it. And uh, we've kind of forgotten how to play in the low post anymore. Yeah. And I think he's the 6'5 guy, does this really, really well. Catches the defender high, looks at him. There he is, okay. And I just drop step and score. Got himself a little bit behind the backboard, but that's a really nice move that he made right there. And it's got a nice basketball team. They yes, got they three do. losses by a total of uh, about six points. Yeah. All right, there you have it. Plays of the week. Always good ones. We appreciate your commentary on those, Mark. We will be right back with the last segment right after this. Welcome back, and now we get a chance to preview the upcoming games, and I get to start on this one. There you go. I got a WBL game this Friday night. Wapakoneta, they stand at 8-3, and 1-1 one and one in the league. They travel to Elida to play in the Fieldhouse. We will be there. Yep. Elida's 11-0. They are 2-0 and and number 3 in Division 2. That is a lofty ranking, especially at this point in the season. Wapakoneta beat Bluffton 51-41 last Tuesday night, and they play tonight against New Knoxville. So that'll see, either get them ready or set them back a little bit. They've got a host of players. Aaron Good, Adam Scott, Gage Schenk, and then Jace Copeland, who we've talked about a few different times, coming off that horrific football injury 
is back playing, not at 100%, but he gives them some great outside yeah. shooting and has really been a lift for them, especially because he seems to come off the bench early in the game and just be on fire, and that usually gets him out to a good lead. Elida beat Piqua on Saturday night. Of course, all the games were canceled on Friday night. 59-40 over Piqua. They were supposed to play at Defiance in that new gym on Friday. It got canceled. They were supposed to make it up on Monday. It got canceled. They're going to try to get it in before tournament starts, I think. Daniel Unruh, Isaac McAdams, Dante Johnson, they're all scoring. We talked about earlier in the yep. year, they need help with Daniel Unruh scoring. They're getting it now. Right. A lot of different people are helping them score, and that's very, very important. And then LCC plays at Elida on Saturday night. That'll be another big game, but Elida cannot look past Wapak. They have trouble with them in the history. Well, you know, you look at it, you go, Daniel Unruh, right? Best player on the floor, but each team is stacked with all kinds of guys who do all kinds of things, including scoring. It's really very balanced for both teams. Mm -hmm. Yep, that'll be a good game. Be a good game. All right, let's move into the NWCC, and that's USV at Perry this week. A USV, well, let's look at what they've got schedule-wise coming up, because they've got uh, Marion Elgin, who's 3-0, leading the conference. Uh, then Temple Christians 2-0, and Riverside's 2-0, and, and USV plays all of them yet coming up through the rest of the season. So this is a big game with Perry. Now Perry, you know, you look at them, well, they're 1-2 and two in conference play, but their losses have been extremely close. An overtime loss to Temple Christian, and then another two-point loss as well in there. So they're playing with everybody, and this will be a struggle for USV. USV started out 3-1, then it went to Kaleida and lost, and that was the game I saw, and they didn't play very well that day. I thought, well, this is not a very good USV team. That's the last time they lost the game. They're 6-0 since then, including a 55-52 win over Pandora Gilboa. SPG's only loss on the season. Uh, they have been giving up just 42.3 points per game in that streak. Defense has been the key to them. That 52 they give up to PG is the most they've given up in that streak right now. They've got four guys who can score at any time. Wyatt Daniels, Wayne Lowry, Brady Hipshire, and a sophomore Quinn Sanders. Uh, Lowry, Sanders, and Daniels have all had 20-plus point games. Hipshire's had an 18-plus point game. They can all score at different times, and they can all make three-point field goals. We've talked about uh, Perry several times this year, but they have not played since January 6th because of the schedule and then because of weather. That was a win over Lima Central Catholic when Logan Dre had 27. If you look at USV, why is this a big game for them? Well, they play Temple Christian on the 26th at home. They play Elgin on, at home on February 9th. They go to Riverside on February 16th. They get all the big guns. Can't stumble against Perry this week. Okay. Well, another team that's in a little bit of Perry shape. They haven't played for a while. Lima Senior. They got snowed out both Friday at Findlay and Saturday against Marion Elgin. But they're going to play Ottawa Glandorf this Saturday. Lima Senior stands at 6-5. and five. Of course, OG 12-0. Ranked number eight in Division Three. I guess I missed it. Can't believe they're only eight. They're really, really good. <laughs> yeah. Lima uh, Senior High lost, uh, or they, they got Whitmer on Friday night. So they're going to play Whitmer on yeah. Friday, OG on Saturday. That is a tough, tough weekend because right. Whitmer's sitting in second place in the track. They're led in scoring by Jaleel King. B.J. Miller is playing very, very well when he runs the point. And I think a real key for them against OG is Jetseal Colon, the six foot eight kid inside, because OG is strong inside. With Kaufman and Dybul in the supporting cast, he is going to have to be a factor. OG had a big win last Saturday at Findlay, and they beat Van Wert just last night, 79-60. Jay Kaufman we mentioned, Jake Dybul, also Owen Hegel playing very, very well at the point. Boy, you got a good point, a good wing, and a good, good post. post. That's you, what you need, right? you got those three things and complementary yeah. players around them. You're pretty they've good. They've got a lot of complementary players, and they've got a great coaching staff. They do. The last time, or the first time I saw Owen Hegel play live was against Lima Senior last year as a sophomore. Eh, this gets pretty good. He was really good against Lima mm -hmm. Senior, and the pressure they brought against him, I thought, this kid is special, mm -hmm. and he has turned out to be he that is. way. He is, yeah. Okay, let's go to Shawnee and Van Wert. We're going to especially focus on Shawnee's weekend, because Shawnee, well, they started out 1-2. and two. They've won nine in a row since then, mostly because their defense has really stepped it up. They give up just 51.1 points per game in that nine-game winning streak. And, of course, we talked about Johnny Capella. You did that earlier. He's averaging 20.5 points a game over the last six games. But the guy who has really come around for them is Sheridan O'Neill, averaging 15 and a half points per game over the last eight. He's made nine three-point field goals at that time. He's been a strong rebounder as well. He is really playing well for them right now. They got a Van Wert team who's three and seven. They're 0 and three in conference play after losing 79-60 on Monday night uh, to Ottawa Glandorf. Jacob Kelly, Blake Hoying, Owen Treese, and Drew Bagley all were in double figures that night. 
Uh, they have uh, three losses by four points or less. Van Wert's dangerous. The problem is they seem to run out of gas late because they just don't have a very good bench coming in right now. If I'm not sure Coach Bagley's trying to strengthen that a little bit. And then Shawnee has another really good game. This is a home game on Saturday night with Wayne Trace. Now, Wayne Trace is 9-2. and two. They're 1-1 one and one in the Green Meadows uh, Conference. They have two losses that are extremely close. What's the difference? Well, they score 60.9 points per game. Uh, does, does Wayne Trace, but in their two losses, they scored just 49 against Lincoln View, and they scored just 45 against Antwerp. So if they can get points on the board, they're dangerous. That'll be a really good matchup between two teams that have good records going into the weekend. All right, let's look at another Saturday night matchup. Minster at 7-2 plays at Fort Loramie. Fort Loramie's 12-0. They are number one in Division IV. This will be a great Saturday night ball game. Minster last night beat Franklin Monroe 74-58. How about these names? Isaac Schmiesing, Jared Hulsman. Sounds like the football yeah, roster, there right? There's a bunch of the others, and they are getting better because of that long tournament run you mentioned with Marion yep. Local. Minster, very similar. They're just getting ready to play with each other, get this weather out of the way. They can really make a, a run down the stretch here. They play New Bremen on Friday night, and that's not easy. New Bremen can score some points coming off a big win. Fort Loramie, last night they beat Thurgood Marshall 58-53 in what looks to have been a pretty good game. And they play Botkins Friday night getting ready for this one. But this could be a real war. And, and everybody's shooting for Fort Loramie now, especially after they beat for sales. Somebody wants to bump off that undefeated team. Minster is capable. I think in that win that uh, Mr. had the other day, Kentner had 21 too, so they've had another score to the mix, and they're playing very well right now. Let's look at a couple of games that are kind of out there a little bit, and that would be games that are next Tuesday night. A couple of big games that take place. Shawnee goes to Crestview. That's three big mm -hmm. games in a row for the Shawnee Indians. They go to Crestview, who's playing very well right now. That's an interesting matchup of two teams that can score. Crestview's been very solid defensively all year long. Let's see how that particular game plays out. And then, of course, the, the war for the Lima Cup that takes place next Tuesday night. It's Lima Senior at Lima Central Catholic. Both of those teams hanging around about the 500. Our Thunderbirds haven't played for a long time. And that'll be an interesting matchup, as it always is in that particular oh, game. That, that'll be really important. Yeah, that's for a fun them. game. Bragging yep. rights plus a yep. chance to get 500 and maybe catapult themselves into a good second half. Yep. Yep. Always a fun game. Big crowd, too. Well, we've seen a lot of games yep. so far. So I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> Who are the best teams in our broadcast area yeah. that you've seen or that you know of so far this season? Well, Fort Laramie is playing extremely well in, the, in one of the lower divisions. You know, we had the win with Versailles, and we had some highlights a moment ago that we showed as well. They're really playing well right now. We saw them a year ago just kind of take Marion Local apart. They were all juniors. We went, that team is really mm -hmm. good. They are ranked number one in Division Four for a reason. They're good. Versailles is good, too, in Division Three. Of course, they're going to go south with their tournament. They've still got to worry about Mr. St. Henry and Marion Local in conference places. So they'll get tested a little bit before they get to that particular point in the season, but Versailles is playing well right now. Pandora Gilboa, can you win two conferences? You know, can you win the BVC and can you win the PCL? You know, you've got to be ready to every single game to play. That's a hard thing to do, to play that many conference games and, and play them well. I think there's 18 conference games in that particular schedule for those two teams. Can they do that? That's interesting right now, but they're playing well. I think in the Western Buckeye League, you've got a whole bunch of teams that are really good right now. Obviously, it's easy to look at Ottawa, Glendorf, and Elida because they're both undefeated right now. But don't forget Wapak and don't forget Shawnee. Those are two teams that are playing well, and I think they can challenge those teams at the top. The Western Buckeye League is kind of a four-team race right now. Well, as always, we're lucky. A lot of state-ranked yes, teams and a lot of tournament games to be played. But that's down the road. We've got games coming your way every week, almost every day. So take a look at the broadcast schedule. Uh, we're going to try to hang in there on some of those makeups as well. I know Ben Reif is going crazy trying to reschedule things and make arrangements with athletic directors. Look at all those games coming, man. Some of the ones we talked about, some we didn't get to, but some great games coming your way on WOSN and WTLW. All right, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week on A Closer Look.